pray that it be really clear that um, anything from me falls to the ground. Everything from you, Lord, just let it resonate in our hearts. I just pray that love, sickness for Jesus is the fruit of everything that's done tonight. I just thank you for the worship. Just thank you so much for the worship. I just thank you for what you're touching us with right now. I just ask all over the room, Holy Spirit, would you just release those angels to touch people? Would you mark, mark us again? We've been marked before with a call. I pray you just stir it up again. Yes. I pray for a forward momentum, Lord. I just pray for a breaking right now of everything that's trying to hinder in Jesus' name. Anything that's trying to pull us back, just break it. Even, even good things, Lord. Even, even our good emotions that are just trying to keep us from going forward. I just break that right now in Jesus' name. And I say forward motion. I just pray for forward vision, a looking forward. Yes. And I just thank you, Lord, that you, you hold all the people. And I just hear the Lord saying, I hold all the people in front of you and behind you. They're my responsibility, not yours. So, God, we just release them to you right now in Jesus' yes. name. We want forward motion. I pray that we all find ourselves closer to each other because we're trying to get closer to you. Yeah. Jesus, would you be the goal? Even tonight, I just pray for the, the new Jerusalem. Would you put it in our eyes? Just, yeah. If you just don't mind, for just a second, just close your eyes with me for a second. Let's just picture the new Jerusalem for a second. 1,500 miles tall. 1,500 miles wide. It's actually a, a mountain. It's like a pyramid. It's, it's, it's a mountain. It's a mountain that has many levels of habitation. So you just picture like Coruscant in the Star Wars movie, like so layer after layer after layer after layer after layer, 1,500 miles of habitation. And the Lord is saying right now over you, he's saying, I'm trying to give you vision tonight of how to be near me. I want you to be at the top. He says there's room at the top for everyone who wants it. I want you to be near me forever. I don't want you in the outer darkness. I don't want you in the lower parts. I want to write the name of the city on your heart. It's my promise to Philadelphia is what he says. I'm going to tell you tonight about Philadelphia, about brotherly love. I'm going to tell you about unity. He says, open your heart. Let go of what you think you know about unity. Let go of what you think you know about heaven. Just for a minute. He says, you don't have to believe everything Tom says to hear from me. Holy Spirit, I'm just asking right now, you'd mark hearts with the truth that you're releasing into every single person. Not what I'm saying. Just, I just declare before you, this is not me praying, I'm just telling you. I know very little about the things I'm going to talk about tonight, but the Holy Spirit knows everything about them. So Lord, would you take those little pieces and put them in the right places? In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to start off by reading from Matthew 25, 1-13, which is the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Now, the parable of the ten bridesmaids is a pretty common parable. You'd be surprised at how many people, when you mention it, don't know what it means or what it's about. And so I'm just going to read This is Jesus gave the parable of the ten bridesmaids right after Matthew 24, which is the Olivet Discourse, the most concentrated end-time information that Jesus ever gave to his disciples was just before he went into that, that Last Supper, just before he went into all those events of his crucifixion. They're sitting there. They're asking him, what is going to happen to know that you're coming back? Like, what, are, what is going to happen? He tells them all these really intense things about the tribulation, which is a seven-year period of increasing trouble because the earth does not want Jesus to, to come and rule it, like the people of the earth. The earth is glad to have Jesus come and rule it. It's the people of the earth being driven by demons that are trying to hang on to a stolen kingdom. The trouble that we see in the earth right now is very clear evidence that Jesus is coming back because the, the power structures as they are right now are freaking out against it. That's how we can know. When lawlessness increases, it's, a, it's actually a breakdown of the authority structure that's been allowed to take root in the earth. The lawlessness that we see is actually, it's a judgment on that very governmental system or systems that are being broken down right now. Sometimes we, we get this picture like the enemy is like winning. He's getting people to be lawless. The enemy doesn't want any of this to happen. The enemy is losing. He likes things quiet, in order. He's He likes to imagine that he can do a better job than God of 
making the earth the way it's supposed to be. And so as things break down, he's not winning. He's actually losing. He doesn't want this to happen. It's just that God knows as his options are more and more limited exactly what choices he's going to make. And that's what's written in this book. And so it's important that we get the right paradigm for what's happening. Because like when you think about the Antichrist emerging, for example, the, the, the devil does not want the Antichrist to emerge because he knows the prophetic promises that when the Antichrist emerges and gets authority, it's only 42 months until Satan's locked up. He knows. He doesn't want any of the prophecies that Jesus gave to happen. In the Antichrist, Jesus prophesied the Antichrist to John. Like, we have to understand, these are things that Satan does not want to happen. He does not want a false temple on the Temple Mount. He doesn't want that to happen because that's a clear sign. He doesn't want any of these things to happen. But he doesn't have any control over the fact that they're going to happen. That's right. And so it gets intense, more and more intense, as Jesus is coming, as his kingdom is emerging. It's the great and terrible day of the Lord. In fact, Joel said it's great and very terrible, like very terrible. Okay, so I'm going to read Matthew 25, 1 to 13, which after Jesus told his disciples all this, he said, it's going to be so intense, like endurance is required. Those who endure until the end, in Matthew 24, he said, they shall be saved. And then he gave this parable at this time. Okay, this is important enough. Actually, let's turn to Matthew 24. I want you to hear the exact context of this parable. I wasn't really thinking about this when I wrote the notes, but this is important. Because he's, he's giving us... Matthew 24, Matthew 25, like in concert, if you are curious about the timing of the Lord's return, like what the events, the order that they'll happen in, it's actually really clear in Matthew 24. And the way that it's really easy to see it for yourself, if you don't mind writing in your Bible, just start in Matthew 24 and start circling time indicators, like then, afterward, and that if you do that, you'll start to see this is laid out chronologically. In Matthew 25, verse 1 says, then the kingdom of heaven shall be like it, okay? And so what does that mean? What, what is the then, okay? And the then is starting in verse 45 of Matthew 24. Jesus says, he gives all these events that about his coming. He says, it's like the days of Noah. People will not even understand. They won't realize it until it's too late, until the flood comes and it's too late to build an ark, right? Then he talks about, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household? This is verse 45, to give them food in due season. He's saying, who is going to be wise when all of this happens is the person that's feeding others the truth at the right time. Food in due season is the word of God at the right time. And we could, I, I won't develop it right now. We could easily show that in the Bible. He says, blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. So we know that we want to be feeding other people the truth at the exact right time when Jesus comes. That means we have to know the truth and we have to know the time. We have to know both in order to be found wise when Jesus comes. Assuredly, this is the reward. I say to you that he will make him ruler. Now, Jesus, I just felt like he was releasing a word to me about being very close to him in that mountain, okay? And this is what this means. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him a ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. Okay, this is a servant. This is not a, this is not an unbeliever. This is not a, you know, a heathen. This is a servant who's like, ah, I think I got some time. I don't want to waste all of my time acting like he's coming if he's not really coming. This is actually the predominant attitude in the church, even in churches that talk about the end times. The predominant attitude is, I don't really want to waste all my time acting like he's coming. He's not, that'd be foolish when I could have been doing what everybody else is doing and getting what everybody else is getting. But you don't want to get what everybody else is going to get. You don't. You want to be found wise. This was, this was heeded by guys 2,000 years ago, and we're still feeding on the fruit of their lives. They were guys just like us. Like, they were people just like us. Jesus picked them out. They said yes. Some people didn't say yes to Jesus. You know, he picked some people out and they didn't say yes to him. The rich young ruler was like, too much, no, right? But these 11 guys, they said yes. They believed this stuff and were still living on the fruit, the fuel of those 70, 80 years. Like, can you imagine 2,000 years later, we're still living on the fuel of hearts that simply said, all right, I'm going to try. I don't, I don't know. Like they said, when are you coming? And John, like, he's on the island of Patmos when he gets the revelation, and he'd already been trying to martyr him. Like, he'd been waiting so long. He's, like, in his 90s, according to most people. 
Like, could you imagine, like, 60 years, and like, I thought you were coming back. But I'm still going to press. He says, this is the patience, the kingdom, the tribulation of Jesus. And we're still right. beating. I mean, you and I are still living on the fuel of 11 lives, like, totally burning, and then another 120, and everyone that caught fire from it. Okay, and so this is what he says, that if he finds you being like that, He'll make you ruler over all of his good, but if you just are like, just doesn't seem that smart because nobody really knows the day or the hour, right? And begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat. And that means be mean to the people that are living like this. You get what I'm saying? It's like, okay, it's not really happening, but when you act like it's happening, it makes me feel like I'm not that holy. And so why don't you cut it out? He says, if I find you doing that and eating and drinking with the drunkards, like acting like it's okay to just be blend in with the rest of the world while you're resisting those who are doing the very thing I told them to, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and at an hour. Now listen, a lot of people say no one knows the day or the hour, but Jesus says, if you don't, I'm going to come at an hour you don't know. Like, what do we do with that? We're not supposed to be okay that you don't know the day or the hour. And I'm going to show you that tonight. Okay, now, and he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, if you look for that phrase, weeping and gnashing of teeth, if you've got a Bible program and just search for it, you're going to find that that usually occurs in the outer darkness, something called the outer darkness. Now, that's not hell. Hell's not actually outer darkness. That's the outer reaches of the kingdom where people will actually regret not giving given everything to Jesus. This is a servant. This is a servant who is in his arrogance saying, I don't need to watch. That's what we're going to talk about tonight, is that arrogance will actually keep you in a place where you think, I don't need to watch. He's not going to let me miss anything. I love him. He loves me. I'm good. I don't want to waste my time acting fanatical when it's not really happening. That's actually very unwise. Okay, so the, at, at this time, then, the kingdom of heaven. So we'll go to the notes now. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Now they had their lamps. They were burning something. The lamp of the body is the eye. That means they had a vision, right? They had a vision for Jesus coming back. That's why they're with the other five that are wise. They had a, a picture. Okay, I, I believe he's coming back. Just not, they don't have anything to fuel it, right? So this is not the unwise servant. These are actually all wise servants that have a vision for him coming back. This is important to understand in the parable of the ten brides. But Holy Spirit, just touch us right now. Would you break off right now false confidence in Jesus' name? Yes. It's really important that we get rid of any false confidence. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight, a cry was heard. That's why we're actually calling this midnight cry. This is the third character in the parable of the Times Bridesmaids. There's wise virgins that are storing up oil, something to burn in their vision, right? The, the lamp of the body is the eye. So the lamp that they're carrying is actually their vision. What's inside of them is the revelation that their vision is actually going to be answered. And what I, this, that's kind of like spiritual language. But what I mean is... When you have a vision that God is your provider and like you do the little step, you run out of money in your checkbook and you just like, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to not worry. I know I got to make it till Friday. I'm going to just, I'm going to choose to not worry, even though everything in my mind says I should be worrying right now. I'm just going to, all right, Jesus, you provided for me before. I'm going to trust you. And then you make it to Friday and you get what you need or you don't, you get it before then. You just got a little bit of oil. That's what that means. So all of us, we're all faced with opportunities every day. So all of you had an opportunity today to trust the Lord. And you either did it or you didn't. You either wasted a lot of time today fretting and worrying about something that didn't move, like pushing on that, you know, that wall that didn't move. I've been spending all week pushing on a wall that will not move. But if you could trust him, you could like let that out. What he fills it with is oil. That's a history that your vision works. And that gives you, when, when all of a sudden your vision's like really troubled because there's so much trouble in the world, you're like, wait, it was way easier for me to believe you were in control before like Christians were being persecuted all around me. And now that they are, 
I, it's harder for me to grab onto the fact that you're in control. And he's like, if you've got oil, if you've got a history of me breaking in for you time and time again, it'll be way easier for your vision to keep burning in that long, dark night. Okay, this is really important to grab onto. They all slumbered and slept. While the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. So the wise and the foolish, they both fell asleep. This is actually happening right now. People who have been laboring in the kingdom for decades right now, even those who have taught the end times are, are completely missing some of the very things that they taught. Now, it hasn't crescendoed. Even, it's not even close to crescendoing yet. It's going to crescendo, I believe, in the next couple of years. But right here we see it's promised that simply having been awake before is not a guarantee that you'll be awake later. Now, wisdom in advance, if you fall asleep, this is really hopeful, right? There comes a moment where somebody cries out, this is it, you get it, you wake up, and you got something to burn in your vision. So we don't need to give up on the people that were like, oh, why aren't you really seeing this? But we do need to understand that there are three characters in the parable of the ten bridesmaids. There's the foolish ones. They fall asleep. When they're woken up, they don't have anything to live on. They don't have any history. They didn't do any of the hard work of sanctification in their hearts. They didn't do the Sermon on the Mount is what that means. That when trouble came, they believed in Jesus, but they didn't use any of the Holy Spirit inside of them to give them love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control. They just kind of went off the rails when bad stuff happened, and they got it back together. Okay, I love you, you love me. And they never got victory over the areas of their heart where the enemy is trying to derail them. It's really important right now. That the, it seems like little things. It seems like I'm, it's just my personality. I just kind of lose it when somebody does that. It's not okay that you're losing major opportunities to store massive oil right now. And the great thing is that it, that it exponentially increases as we get closer and closer to that midnight cry. Like if you'll stay awake, you actually get more oil right now. Okay, at midnight a cry was heard, behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Now someone is awake in this parable, right? Ten breaths, somebody who's looking for the bridegroom, like someone is awake. That's who I want to teach people how to be that character in the parable of the Ten Bridesmaids. If you're awake, that means you're a watchman. Everybody say watchman. If you search out the word watchman in the Bible, you're going to find that there's a ton of information, Old Testament and New Testament, about watchmen. Now, watchman is actually synonymous with witness. Everybody say witness. Witness. There's several witnesses in the Bible. John the Baptist is a witness. It says that he, he, was, he came, John 1 says he came as a witness to the light, but he was not that light. Elijah, he was a witness to the power of God. Moses was a witness of the delivering power of God. In the end times, there are two witnesses promised in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 11. Witness and watchman, they're the same thing. I'm gonna sh I'll, I'll develop that as we talk tonight for a little bit. Okay, now, it says, Then all those versions, when the witness or the watchman cries out, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, all those versions arose, all the people that were investing themselves in watching for the bridegroom at some point in time, okay, and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. I forgot to get a history in God. I forgot that when I ran out of money, I could have had victory over all that worry. I just worried my way through it. I gripped my teeth and bared it. No, I got nothing because this is bigger than I can grip my teeth and bear. It's too long is what it means. It's too dark. It's too intense. You don't want to try and jump over like a 10-foot hurdle when you could have jumped over one foot, two foot, three foot hurdles the whole time and accomplished all of the strength building that you needed. But a lot of people, in presumption, they just kind of imagine that their faith is going to rise to the occasion as some great breaking wave of trouble happens. It never works that way. There's not a story in the Bible about that. There's stories in the Bible about people walking out in faithfulness in what seemed like the mundane, what seemed like the small, and then suddenly the big happened. Good example is David, right? Goliath, he's there. He's threatening the armies of Israel. And David's like, well, I did the bear thing. I did the lion thing. Okay, I think I got the giant thing. All these armies, like with weapons and armor, like none of them had, had that history in God. They didn't have the oil, and they didn't have the vision. you got to get it now. Okay, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answer is saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you. I really don't have time to teach you all of these things right now. Do you see how intense it is in the world 
Like, I need to focus on what the Lord is doing right now. I'm getting myself, actually, these people are mostly getting themselves into the tabernacle of David, pressing hard for the release of the very things that they've been storing up in their hearts for a long time. We're going to find this as the end times unfold. It, the world would say that this is unkind to focus so much on God and not help all the people that need all the helping. But that's actually a scheme of the enemy to break the first commandment from the second commandment. The enemy wants people to love people with all their mind, soul, heart, and strength so that they will not connect with God. And if you do that, you'll run out of what you need to even love people in the first place. So Jesus said the two greatest commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And as we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus, we're going to see the wise ones are actually going to spend most of their time Pressing hard to love Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that means that those who didn't care about it going into that time, they're going to be like, help us, you know what to do. And they're going to say, I really can't because what he's telling me to do is to press harder after him. And I love him and he's coming and I'm not going to be found unfaithful. Amen. There's going to be a lot of very offended people. Now listen to me. Great and terrible is the day of the Lord. The great things that God is going to release on some Groups of people are going to offend other people who feel like they earned it. And the terrible things that God is going to let happen to some groups of people are going to offend other people who don't have a paradigm in their mind for the fact that this was always promised and for 2,000 years we were supposed to be getting ready for it and watching. Both the positive and the negative aspects of the end times are going to offend people. And this, is, this parable is actually highlighting this. These are all end time believers. Some of them refused, even though they were in the meetings, even though they came to the, to the worship gatherings and the prayer meetings, they just refused to do the, the thing only they could do. Only you can store oil. No, you, it doesn't matter who you hang out with. It doesn't matter who lays hands on you, anoints you, tells you how great you are, brings you up on a platform. No one can store oil for you but you. And you have tons of opportunities every day. And usually they look like a lack of money, a lack of time, and people that bug you. Those are the three primary ways to store oil, and we all have them. We all have them. And you've got to actually start taking it seriously right now because there'll come a moment where a few, a company of a few will be like, this is what I was made for. I know exactly what's happening. I'm burning, and no, I don't have time for lunch, really. I'm going to a prayer meeting. I don't really have time to spend two hours explaining to you the, the thing I've been doing for the last ten years that you would not listen to. You've got to do it now, and you've got to choose it for yourself. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but rather go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Oh, what? They were right? They were pressing so hard for God because he actually is coming? He's promised to come this way. Hear what I'm saying. He's promised to come, and a few are going to be ready, and a bunch are not, or at least 50%, right? Five are ready, five are not. Just think about that. Just think about the church in the city of Kalamazoo. Just think about this room. We just split it in half. Half are ready, half are not. Arrogance, <laughs> arrogance says, I'm ready. I'm good. Sorry, Dave, I wasn't picking on you. <laughs> I was just going there in the message. Arrogance says, he's just joking anyway, because I know Dave, he doesn't think that. He prays all the time because he knows that something's coming. Arrogance says, I'm good. I'm in the group. I kind of know the stuff. I read Jennifer LeClaire's post, you know, I kind of touching base with what Bill Johnson is saying, and like, I'm good. Too bad for all those people that don't know. No, that's not wise. That's actually arrogance, and it keeps you from responding. Wisdom is praying out. People are coming. Pride is coming. Get ready. You know, we cry out, oh, God, bring the people. God, bring the glory. God, bring the fire. But we don't get ready. We don't get rid of the little foxes that are in the garden. We've got to get rid of the pride. We've got to get rid of the arrogance, the dullness. Just the, you know, I get home at night and it's like the, the easiest thing for me to do is just to veg out and just let something come into my brain that maybe it's not evil. Like, I'm sure, like, if Jesus was sitting there watching it with me, he wouldn't be mad. But is it helping me burn? No. Okay. That's all right. It's okay if I use that opportunity to say, Jesus, I'm not okay that I'm not burning until my head lays down on the pillow and I don't wake up with zeal to find out what you're saying to me. I wake up in the morning at like 4.30 in the morning most days, and I would like to pretend for you that I'm like Bible open, praying, but I'm, not. I'm mostly like waiting for the coffee to get made, and I'm like, I'm just going to check the news. 
or I'm going to look at Facebook. And then an hour goes by and I'm like, oh, I meant to touch your heart. I meant to like spend time hearing what you've got to say. And I could spend two hours in the name of Jesus, never actually talking to Jesus. Right. Like that's, that won't help me that much. Now he's not mad about that. He's like, you're trying. But if I, if I'm okay with that, if I just tell myself, well, I was looking at the news because I care about Jesus, then I could actually short circuit all of the chances I have to watch and to pray and to get ready. But if I'll just say, Jesus, I'm not okay that I wasted an hour and a half this morning. I took the last half an hour, pressed as hard as I could for the last half an hour. That's not okay with me. Then what he'll do is over time, it'll become more and more natural that I wake up ready. I've had seasons. I'm sure some of you guys have. I've had seasons where my head is up and all I want to do is hear what he said. Usually they're very short lived. That's okay. I'm still a baby. I'm still a child, right? It's, if I get satisfied that they're short-lived, that's when it's a problem. Right. What we don't want to do is get comfortable that we're all that in a bag of chips before he comes back. We just don't want to do that. Okay, now, so he comes, and it says that the door was shut to those. Now, afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. You see, it's all about knowing him. We can come, we can get together, we can worship, we can pray. Like, we can worship and feel like he's happy with us without knowing him. The, the heart, Jeremiah said the heart is so slippery. Like, get a hold of that sucker. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. your heart will constantly try to get you to believe that you're something that you're not. Mm -hmm. And so we just say, okay, Jesus, I'm not okay that I'm not really connecting with you. I'm not okay that I'm worshiping and I'm kind of wondering, am I doing it in a way that makes other people know that I love you? That's typically one of the ways that the enemy will try to get us to, to get away from Jesus and into the flesh. Are, am I doing it in a way that people can tell that I'm so zealous for you? Now, everybody does it. I mean, if we're honest, every single person does it. But very few will say, wait a second, I just caught myself doing it again. I'm not okay with that. Refocus me. I want to get back into it and get to victory over it little bit by little bit by little bit. We think if we can fool everybody around us and fool ourselves that God must miss it. He doesn't. He knows exactly what's going on in our hearts. And so all we do is we're like, this is what David did. When David's sin was found, David was one of the, he was a major sinner. Like, I don't know if you know this about David or not. But when he was found out, the first thing he did was he ran into the arms of God. He's like, I agree. That guy stinks about himself. I can't believe that happened, but you do. You know that it happened. I'm not okay that I did that, right? That's the mode that allows us to grow. When we admit we're not really that good at controlling what's going on in here, and we just say, okay, I'm not a good governor of this, but you are, and you're for me, and so I just keep coming back to you. That's how David became the man after God's own heart. Because God always intended for us to be kids and him to be dad. He never intended for us to be the ones that broke through all the flesh, broke through all of the childhood and became the adults. And are you so proud of me now because I did it for you? And he's like, no, that's the garden. That's what happened with Adam and Eve. I don't want you to do that. I want you to admit that you can't do it and then give yourself to me. And in this process, I'll know you and you will become the son that I always wanted you to be or the daughter that I always wanted you to be. But it's in the releasing of the relationship, letting me be the parent instead of trying to control every aspect, get it all nailed down so that God will just continue to like unlock that thing. No, it's about being a kid. I'm kind of going off the nose. That's all right. Now watching, this is all about watching because what I'm describing is keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. I, I know the time. I mean, you're worried, but I know the time. I am, because I was saying. I know. 30 minutes. I'm a kid. All right. Woo! Well, all I can do. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We work in partnership this way. Yeah. Sam reminds me of the time, and then I speed it up. Okay, so I give all of this, all these examples to say all of it is about keeping our eyes on Jesus. The whole Bible I mean, and you don't want to just simplify it like this because you'll, you'll just you'll get arrogant and think I got it all down. But all of these stories are about people talking to God and God talking to people. Like when you get off track, something I found when I start to get off track and I'm like, I, I just get in my own mental kind of mix and I, I can't touch his heart. 
I just remember, oh wait, it's as simple as me talking to you and you talking to me. If I can get back to that place, everything just kind of lines up. Seek the kingdom first and everything else is added unto you. It really is. Okay, now watching is all about love. So when we hear about watchmen, we hear about witnesses, we hear about John the Baptist, the entire process is about love. It's about being in love with Jesus and loving others because of that. In fact, it's funny because Jessica Kankan and I were just talking about raising kids this way, but watching is beholding and becoming. Okay, and so in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18, we find out that the way that we become transformed, the way we become more like God, the way that we grow up is by watching Dad or watching Jesus, right? Jesus was actually a witness of the Father. He says to, to Philip, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He came as a witness. That's why choosing to be a watchman, choosing to be a witness is choosing to be like Jesus. Now, if you remember the story of Peter and James and John and, and the disciples going into the Garden of Gethsemane, who was the only guy that stayed awake all night? Jesus. He stayed awake. Now, it wasn't exactly enjoyable the whole time, right? He's sweating blood. He's trying to wake those guys up. This is what it means to be a watchman. It means to be concerned about your friends falling asleep, but your primary thing is you want to get understanding from the Father. Father, why is this happening? What are we doing? Do I have to do it this way? But he's awake and he's in touch with the Father who's executing a plan. This is what it means to be a watchman or a witness, okay? It's about beholding and becoming. Now, Jesus didn't need to become like the Father. He, he is the representation of the Father. But for us, we're a witness of Jesus. We need to be become, becoming more like him. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. That means that there's a freedom to do this. You've got to have the Holy Spirit actually to do this. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit because this is really worship. Worship is watching. We worship what we can see. Adam and Eve were made this way because they could see God. It was actually a safety mechanism because God knew if their eyes would connect with him, they would desire him. Now, Satan came and lied and promised them something that wasn't true, something more he set their eyes of their heart on something more, but it wasn't true. Worship, that's why you like, it's so important what you put into your mind, what you put in, like the music that you listen to, the things that you lay your eyes on, the things you desire with your eyes, you actually will start to become like that which you lay your eyes on over and over, and that's actually worship. That's why when we come here, what we're mostly trying to do is isolate the connection between us and him and just give him our attention. That's what he wants. He's that. He wants, he loves our attention because it helps us. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, bit by bit, little hurdle by little hurdle. I'm running out of money. Oh, wait, I'm looking at your kingdom. You own a cattle on a thousand hills. I know, everybody says it, but I'm going to actually choose to believe it right this second instead of worrying. I'm going to get a, a five-minute victory over worry. A five-minute victory over worry will go a long way for storing oil. You don't have to do this perfectly. You just have to want to do it, right? And the five-minute right. victory, according to this, becomes the 10-minute victory, becomes the 20-minute victory, becomes the day. I didn't worry about it. It becomes the week. I didn't worry about it. It becomes... How does that guy go through all this trouble and he seems so okay? How can they say all these things about him and he just like he's still focused, he's still going? How can she run out of everything she's been working for and still she's happy? Because she learned glory to glory, strength to strength, to actually believe the promises of the Bible. And it only happens, part change only happens one way. It happens day by day in the pain that we all feel. We're all like, how long is this gonna last? He's like, until you're done because you want me, right? You want to live with me forever. You don't quit. I don't quit. And I make you bigger. I'm never going to make the day smaller. The days that are coming are never going to get smaller. He said this to me a couple of years ago. And I'm like, Jesus, when am I going to have more time and more money so I can focus on this? He says, never. <laughs> That's not the point. The point is that your heart would grow. And that you'd be able to do it no matter what was going on around you. That's the point. That's, That's right. where Adam and Eve got off. Yeah. Right? we got to get to the point where no matter what the enemy lies to us about, we're staying fixed on the Father. We're listening to the Father. We're believing His yeah. promises. Yeah. That's what the entire end times are about. It's a crescendoing of trouble so that out of that, one pure and spotless bride would emerge that would say, I don't care what 
My eyes tell me I don't care what the devil says. I don't care what the world says about me. I love him, and I'm getting stronger to stay with him no matter what happens. Yes. The tribulation is what makes us ready for the rapture. The rapture doesn't get us out of the tribulation. The rapture is the moment when all of that heart change becomes visible. Everything that you were burning for on the inside suddenly becomes outwardly visible to everyone. You don't want the rapture to take you out of the very thing that was designed to get you very glorious. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, now the entire book of Revelation is about the revealing of Jesus. So if watching is about love, if it's about beholding who he is and becoming like him, the revelation of Jesus Christ is the name of the book. The whole book is about getting us to see more and more of who he is so that we could grow in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. And so if you read the book of Revelation and you're like, that sounds kind of scary, that's perfect. Because Jesus is like, bring that to me. Talk to me about it. What's scaring you? Why is it scaring you? If I'm perfectly powerful and perfectly loving, where those two intersect, you got nothing to worry about. So why is it that you're afraid? Oh, well, I guess I don't trust you all the way in the area of money. I guess I don't trust you all the way in the area of time. I guess I don't really know that if that's real, if those demons are really coming out of the pit, they're really stinging people for five months, I guess I don't really know that you're good when that happens. Okay, I don't love you all as much as I could. Perfect love casts out all fear. When we go through that cycle over and over, I read the book of Revelation, I take it main and plain, it looks pretty intense. I don't know, I see some of the things happening in the world, it is making me a little bit afraid. What is going to happen when these cities erupt? What is going to happen when the economy fails? Okay, I got a chance right here to, to store some oil. I got a chance to learn to love you, to see your heart in it, to see that I don't need to pray away every earthquake, I need to get your heart for why there's some promised in this book. I don't need to pray away all the trouble. I need to pray myself into it ready. There's a whole bunch of the church that believes in positive thinking. Positive thinking is a false New Age religion. Yes, that's right. I believe in the promises that he gives, and I want to be like Moses and say, Pharaoh, let these people go, or there's something coming, and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of the judgments of the Lord. That happens as we study it and we grow in love. That's what a watch. This is why John the Baptist, in perfect, well, not perfect love, but the love that he could muster as a man, Jesus said, greater than any man born of a woman up until that time, that man who reflected love better than any other person born of a woman to that time said, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee the wrath to come. That was love. That was love. Because he knew a lake of fire, eternal lake of fire, is worse than the condemnation of a man saying, look, you're not really doing the thing that will save your life. We need to be a people that are willing to say to the church and to the world, you're not really doing the thing that will save your life. I'm not saying that because I think I'm better than you. I'm saying it because I actually care about you. There's a ton of self-interest in people that will never say anything for fear that it might disrupt their position, disrupt their popularity, and the church is rife with this right now, rife with it. This is very, very negative, according to the passages about end-time bridesmaids. If we really love people, we'll take a chance, believe that he's really coming, and give them food in due season. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. It's the time. That's what the Lord says. It's the time. Can you, do you see what's happening in the news? Do you see what's happening in the church? Do you see the slide into immorality and it being celebrated by the church as, as tolerance and love? It's time to speak the truth to the church in love. In love. Whoa. That's hard to do. It's easy to ramp up to win an argument. It's hard to say the true thing meekly like Jesus and believe that the Lord can keep you in it. Now, Revelation 1 begins with 30 descriptions of who Jesus is. Revelation 2 and 3 highlight very specific elements of who Jesus is that addresses, so this is what I'm saying. The whole book of Revelation is about learning to see Jesus better. It starts with 30 descriptions of who Jesus is intentionally because it's the whole basis, the foundation for watching as a watchman and being able to release what you see. If you can't see Jesus in those 30 descriptions of Revelation 1, you really don't have a lot of food to give the people in due season. Now, Revelation 1 is one of the hardest books to really study out because it's short and it's easy to be like, I kind of got that, first born from the dead, first and last, Alpha and Omega. You know, you can do like a, you know, a home group on that for half a year and you're like, I graduated from that. No, 
This is where we mine out his heart over and over. It's the foundation of the book of Revelation. But in Revelation 2 and 3, we meet the bride-to-be, bridesmaids, right? We meet the ones that are about to be joined to him, those who are going to go to the wedding. And we find out, oh, there's five of them that if they don't really change their paradigm of what they see in him, they are going to not overcome what is coming. Wisdom looks at the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, and takes every one of those warnings personally. Right. All right, where am I loveless? Ephesus. Where am I compromising the word? Where am I getting lost in the, the excitement of my reputation, but I really don't have any of the Holy Spirit stuff really happening? I can pretend like it's happening. I can get all worked up. I can be in a group of people. We're all celebrating. The whole city thinks, man, that place is on fire. But the truth is, the Holy Spirit's doing very little to change my heart, who I am, right? Gold dust doesn't generally change who you are more than once or twice you sing. What's really going on in here? Where are you really becoming more trusting in the area of your money? Where are you really becoming more patient when people legitimately bug you? Where are you really becoming more believing, more self-control? Like all the, all the jumping around, the dancing, the gold dust, the glory, the angels. I love all of it. But what is it? What good is it if I'm not ready to meet Jesus when he opens heaven? I'd rather have 20 hours on the floor, nothing happening if my heart is changing so I could be with him forever. But I want both, right? We, want, we don't have to give up the one to get the other, but we can't give up the one to get the other. Like you can't. It's not enough to feel excited. It won't help you. You have to be growing, maturing in a readiness with oil because it's coming to get tested, okay? Now, if we see who Jesus really is, both his meekness and his power, his mercy and his unbending judgment, we can't help but love him more. But so few people, so few, actually focus on both, the, on the narrow road. They get lost on one side, the mercy, or they get caught up in the judgment, but very few people will actually walk in the tension that squeezes the oil out of the person. Mm -hmm. Going one way or the other is untrue. He's, he, his justice never gets suspended for his love, and so we got to find a way to see both in it, and it's very hard to do. It's hard for the human mind to see both. It's easier for some people to see the judgment. Hey, those people got to stop it. Right? They're going to lose it. They're going to miss it, and I'm okay. No, you're not, actually. Or, everything's fine. Why is everybody so worried? It doesn't matter. We're all good. No, you're, neither one of those will work when you're in front of the man who rules with a rod of iron. We have to be, oh, we got to change. Oh, he's so merciful. Why doesn't he? Oh, it's a tension that is actually squeezing oil into your vision that will burn. Perfect love casts out all fear. And that's 1 John 4, 17, 8. Love has been perfected among us. And this, this is an end time statement. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he's, that means looking at who he is and becoming more and more like him incrementally, what that will do is give you a boldness in the day of judgment. It'll actually keep you. That's what makes the sermon. I mean, I'm sure some people, some of us are like, why do we keep talking about the Sermon on the Mount? Like, it's a few chapters, it's kind of cool. The Sermon on the Mount is actually everything that this book is about. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are all the ways that you learn how to see God in all the circumstances of your life. And it's, it mostly starts with the Beatitudes, which are looking at Jesus' heart and then looking at your own and mourning those areas where we don't line up. There's so much more to it. I mean, the, the Sermon on the Mount, will be mining the Sermon on the Mount in a thousand years, a million years. We'll still be going back to it we'll, because this is the way that God's government works. God's entire Order in, the, in all of creation works this way. There's four seraphim. They're looking at who he is. When they see something, it's so glorious, they cover up their eyes and they yell it out. This is the way that his government has always worked since he created. It will always work this way. And so when we get into that process, we're actually becoming citizens of another kingdom, of another age. But if we never get into that process, it's like we walk in the gate, but we don't know how anything works. We don't know, like what it's all about. We don't really even care. We just kind of feel falsely comfortable that we're okay. But he's got a holy mountain that is ruled from the very top entirely by watching, by, by desiring to see a glimpse of God and releasing it and taking part in the 
The sharing of his glory. His whole government is a release of glory from the top all the way to the bottom. And he's inviting us right now to get to that place where we spend most of our time looking at who he is. This is why this, these realities are expressed in night and day prayer. Everything that I'm ever going to talk about, anytime you come here and listen, to, at least when you listen to me preach, there's a lot of people that are going to preach here, I'm always going to be talking about night and day prayer. I'm never going to stop until he comes. And even then, in heaven, because this is the only way heaven works. I want to be like vice president or like in the Senate. I want to be very, very close to the center of power. And the center of power, according to Revelation 4, is entirely based on voluntarily paying attention to God him showing me things, me saying it, and me growing in authority and power because I simply know what dad likes, what dad is like, what he loves, what he hates, and I agree with him in it. And he's like, the more you do that, the more I'll draw you near to me. And those seraphim, those four living creatures, they are alive and on fire. Somebody tonight prayed about the burning bush, I think it was Jerry Reeves. And when she did, what she's praying about is a real life that released revelation. Like it was the living, burning fire of God that changed the ground. Moses had to take off his shoes. It actually started to change the earth back to the Garden of Eden right there. And God is like, you got to understand this is so sacred. you got to do something different right now. Yes. The revelation will change the way that you act. It will change the holiness of who he is. He requires sanctification. It's why the first night that we opened this thing, I'm like, I really think we got to take seriously guarding this sanctuary. Because his fiery presence, it demands it. And, and Moses yeah. just running into it in the desert demanded a different course of action. <clears throat> now, Revelation is the single most feared book in the Bible, but it's also the most love-producing book to study because of this reaction of being afraid of the true realities, bringing it to Jesus. What that will do is produce love, and that produces oil, and the whole thing is watching. I know I'm running out of time. It's okay. We have a lot of time in the future. <laughs> the point of Revelation is literally the presentation of who he is so we can watch and become, become like him to be ready for his coming. When he comes, it's not going to be slap the approved stamp on everybody. Everybody's okay. When he comes, he's coming to judge the living and the dead, both. He's coming to judge everyone. Now, some people he judges at the Bema Seat, the place of reward. Other people he judges at the Great White Throne Judgment, which is very negative. But everybody's going to be evaluated. That's the point. And the, the Bema Seat is where the Olympians would race the race. Paul said, I live like I'm running a race, and I'm running for a crown that doesn't perish. It's not like I'm running for an Olympic gold medal. I'm running for something that is going to be rewarded and recognized forever and ever and ever and ever. I'm always going to be known as somebody who ran as hard as he could. You want to be known as somebody who ran as hard as they could. This requires focus. The Bible says where people lack revelation, where they lack watching, right? The midnight cry comes from somebody who's watching, who's awake. If you lack revelation, you'll cast out restraint. People perish is what it says, where there's no revelation, the people perish. The point of revelation is, to, is literally the presentation of who he is so we can watch and become like him to be ready for his coming. You can't fully love Jesus without giving yourself to a study of who he is. And that is mostly concentrated, honestly, in the book of Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus. It's all going somewhere. The whole Bible is going to a final chapter that then is the opening up of everything that was lost in the fall. And so if you live in the time when that chapter is being actually lived out and you're spending most of your time in a different part of the story and just kind of comforting yourself that you care about the story... You're missing the whole point. We live in the time of the book of Revelation. Like literally, whether you believe me about the time or like if you think it's a hundred years from now, we're still, all of those first writers of the New Testament believe they were living in the time of the book of Revelation by their words. Mm -hmm. Like if you're stuck in some other part of the story because you just think I'm connected to the story, it's all good. That's not good if you're not connected to what the story is about. The story is about him coming and there's promised a company of people called the bride and like there's all this information about how she's going to act and how she's going to fall away and how she's going to choose to love him and how she's going to press in. And if you're not watching for any of these things, you're just kind of like, I'm good because I'm in the group or I care about the Bible or, you know, we can just kind of do what I'm interested in. It doesn't work like that. 
This is a very specific story laid out in a very specific way for a very specific purpose, all leading to a very specific time. And you don't want him to come at an hour you don't know, right? That was that beginning to the parable of the ten bridesmaids. I want to go to page two of the notes. I'm going to take the last ten minutes. You have more than ten. Jacob said he could have more. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> All right, so witnessing, actually on page two of the notes, witnessing is a mercy ministry. It makes us like Jesus who witnessed to the world who the Father is. I said that already about Philip and Jesus saying, look, this is who I am. Watching makes us like Jesus. Now, we're supposed to be witnesses of his coming because we're supposed to adjust the eyes of That's actually what Jesus did in his first coming. What Jesus did, now it's easy to kind of get lost, and this is, I don't have the fullness of it, I just have a little glimpse of it, but part of what Jesus did is he came, he showed us who the Father was, and then he withdrew to see who wants to say yes and actually get ready to live with a guy who's like this, to live with a dad who's like this. You want to know about why like he came and then left? It was for love. He won't force us to love him. So he came, he revealed who the Father is, and then he withdrew it and said, anyone who wants it, come after me. There's a ton of people in the church that think they just got their passport stamp. They never go after him. You have to go after him. The whole point is to grow in readiness to love him forever. And if you won't do it now, you won't do it then. Now is the time we need it the most, right? <coughs> now witnessing, it adjusts the eyes of the earth. 1 Timothy 6.16 says he lives in unapproachable light. Like he's so brilliantly bright that it will hurt you to see him if you are not ready for it. And right now, some of us see more than others. If you stay awake and you declare what you're seeing, like those seraphim, it's actually a mercy ministry letting other people know what to get ready for, what to expect, what's available to them. But if you don't care about them or the process, it's easy just to kind of be happy with the revelation you have and think, well, I got more than anybody else I know. I'm kind of good. That's not the way that Jesus did. Jesus kept pressing. In fact, he got all the way to the point where he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. This is, the, this is his mercy. He was taking people to the place where they're completely unready for that level of holiness and glory. It was true what he was saying. It's easy to be like, well, he's just being symbolic. He's just kind of, no, it was true what he was saying, but can our hearts bear it? Can our hearts bear to hear those words and understand what they really mean? Those guys couldn't. Almost everybody left when he said it. There's so much more glory than we've ever touched. When those guys went up in the Mount Transfiguration with Jesus and he showed them himself bright shining through his clothes, that's nothing compared to how bright he really, really is. Right. And so if we want people to be ready for that, we have to get into that place where we're gazing as much as we can, seeing as much as we can, releasing as much as we can, listening to other people as much as we can, growing together in a revelation, a 360 degree revelation so that we're even marginally ready to see him. And it's easy to just couch it in, this is my ministry area, this is what I care about, this is what I'm kind of focused on. No, that's not okay. Right. Because he's more. He's so much more. And if you get a narrow, narrow glimpse, one little spectrum of light, you just see violet, 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 all the other fullness of the spectrum will actually hurt you. Jesus said his coming will be like a thief in the night. It will actually take something from you that could have been yours forever. Now watching it adjust our expectations of the, as the great and very terrible of the day of the Lord unfolds. So I want to go right now to Matthew 24, 8 to 13. It's on page two of the notes, so you can look at it in your Bible. This is what Jesus said about his coming. All these things are the beginning of the start. He's talking about the earthquakes, the rumors of war, the famines. We all kind of know that passage. He says, that's the beginning. Then they will deliver you. Now, he's talking privately to his disciples, his best friends, up to tribulation and kill you. And you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. Many will be offended when this happens. In the church, many will be offended. Now, how do we know that? Well, look at the passage. What's going to happen? They'll betray one another. To betray somebody, you actually had to have some kind of agreement that you were uh, simpatico, right? They'll hate one another. Then many false prophets. Well, false prophets, are you talking about Christians? Well, yeah. 
Christian prophets are the only ones that we listen to. They're the only ones we really need to be warned about. I'm not really worried about the false Buddhist prophet. Right. It's false Christian prophets. This is all actually happening right now. The, the divisions about race, the divisions about money, the divisions about homosexuality, they're actually causing massive offense to start in the church. It's going to a place you would not believe. When the government, this is my, this is not a word from the Lord, and this is not what the passage says, but in Nazi Germany, when the government started to say, look, churches, either you kind of told the company line here, or we're going to start putting the clamp down on you, the church split in half. There were whole denominations that still exist to this day that were splits that went with Nazi Germany. Hitler started to rewrite the Bible, put himself as the leading character in the Bible for real. Hitler claimed to be a Christian. This is coming, guaranteed. What's coming is going to be way worse than Nazi Germany. And we have to understand that if we don't watch for it, if we don't try to find the truth in what's happening right now, then we really don't have a ton of incentive that could be ours to really get serious about those little things that are bugging us today. Those yeah. little things that threaten our faith today. If we get a vision for what's coming, all of a sudden it's like, yeah, okay, I can deal with the lack of money. I can deal with the press of my time. I can deal with that person that's bugging me because I see them as a little hurdle that's getting me ready for something I can't imagine. But if we got no vision for that, if we don't watch for it at all, then everything just seems like the same. And in fact, that's one of the things that Peter warned about. There'll be mockers that come and say, it's always been this way. Ever since the fathers, it's always been this way. And all that does is steal all the, all the incentive to really watch and take it seriously and learn how to burn. We have to learn how to burn, not just for ourselves, but for other people. We're surrounded by people. They have no idea any of this is happening. I mean, we could literally go out and just walk down the street. Every single person we touched, maybe one in 200 would have any idea what's going on at all. Do we love them? Or do we want them to stay comfortable and hope that they come to our church and like think that we're cool? <laughs> they don't think we're cool anyway. Right. Why don't we go all the way to uncool and telling them the truth about what's coming? This is really coming. Amen. It's really coming fast. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'll give you a couple more passages there about how great and terrible it is. Now, it's not just the, it's not just the bad things that are going to offend people. It's also the good things. Right. God's going to touch some congregation, not, not even just congregation, he's going to touch some people's desire with massive, massive down payments of glory. And some of them are going to get offended with that very thing that they asked for. And some of them are going to have other people that get offended with them because they feel like it's not fair that they're getting it. This whole thing is a mix of emotions. The only safe place is the rock in the, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus ends in Matthew 7. He says, if you build your house on this rock, then when the waves come and the winds come, it's not all negative. There's a north wind and a south wind. There's right. both. When the south wind comes, you won't get off the, the rock. And when the north wind comes, you won't get off the rock. But if you see good things happening to you as approval and bad things happening to other people as rejection, you'll be a complete mess. Bad stuff is going to happen to good people, and good stuff is going to happen to bad people, and good stuff is going to happen to good people, and bad stuff is going to happen to bad people. And he's a dad, and he knows, and he told us, if you'll get in the Sermon on the Mount, none of that will derail you. But you've got to have a vision for why holiness matters. Paul cared about holiness because Paul needed holiness, because he needed connection. He needed glory. He needed power. And so he's like, I'm getting clean because more power comes than the shipwreck and the snake bite and the Roman centurion and being held in prison. None of that stuff messes me up. Yeah. You've got to get some holiness. You have to. You've got to get serious about consecration and sanctification. And that's why I'm kind of being serious about let's watch what we talk about in this place. Let's actually watch how casually we treat it. And it, it happens all the time to me. And I'm, I'm sitting here, and it's like, I think of something, and I want to say that thing, or, you know, it makes sense to eat in here because we're hanging out in here. And the Lord is just like, if you'll take it seriously, if you'll guard it, I will release something that I could only release in a consecrated place. We need it. We need what he wants to release in this place. But that means we got to do something kind of uncomfortable and weird, which is... Act like this place is holy already, so it's ready for the holiness to come. That's what the whole point of watching is, is you start to live in a way that's in advance of what's coming. That's what John the Baptist did. He started to live holy because he saw it. He said, you think I'm intense because I'm calling you a brood of vipers? I'm not even worthy to hold his sandals. He's coming with fire. He's going to baptize you with fire in the Holy Spirit. We'd be like, that sounds great. And he's like, no, well, kind of. 
If you're ready, it's great. If you're not, very, very negative. 500 witnessed the resurrection. 120 were in the upper room. What happened to the rest of them? Yeah. Fire. <laughs> Holy Spirit. Offense. Betrayal. All over the place in history with the church. It's coming. It's happening right now. We're here because it happened. It's going to happen much, much more. So we can't feel like we graduated. We have to feel like, whoa, we stepped into something that is going to compound all the way until he comes. Now is the time for sober-minded, self-control, glory for sure, but glory in truth. In that throne room, there's no one making a mockery of God. There's snap. That's right. But there's a lot of glory in that room. There's a lot of joy at his, at his right hand, our pleasures evermore. So how do we do that? How do we find out something we don't know, but then we guard the truth of holiness? Well, that would just have to take a miracle, wouldn't it? For us to let everything happen that's supposed to happen, not shut it all down, but at the same time, be listening to the Holy Spirit moment by moment and doing the real thing to administer a throne room reality. That's impossible for man, but everything's possible for God. If we want to get to that place, we've got to be watching. That's the whole point of Midnight Cry. I'm going to stop talking now. Stand with me for a minute. There's more in the notes. There's a whole like message in the notes. You just got some of my random thoughts. And the Holy Spirit. Hopefully some of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we just need you so bad. We're children. We hardly know about these realities. I just pray that we listen to your warnings, Jesus. Just if you want to hear his warnings with a new clarity, I just want you to, let's just do something. Let's just raise our hands to him. It's like we're in school. <laughs> He's handing out some vibrancy tonight. I just hear him saying, I'm going to hand out some vibrancy. Jacob, do you mind coming back up? He's going to hand out some vibrancy. You can receive if you want to. You don't have to come up. It's kind of culture. Holy Spirit, all over the room. With hands raised, I'm asking that you touch hearts with vibrancy for the other. You seal information to them. You seal it in our hearts. I pray that it's burning. It's a seed of fire yes. all over the room. Just a seed of fire in our hearts. That we go to bed tonight thinking on the coming of Jesus. That we wake up in the morning thinking, I need it, God. I'm just, I repent that I wake up in the morning and I'm not thinking about the coming of Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you touch us with thinking about the coming of Yeshua, the glorious one, the King of kings, Lord of lords, firstborn from the dead. He rules with a rod of iron. He says, I'm unbending, unflinching in the way that I'm going to administer my kingdom. You can get ready right now. I want you at the top of my holy mountain. I do. Do you want to be there? Jesus, we're saying yes. Our hands are raised. We're saying yes. We want to be there with you. But we're so weak. We're so immature. We're so distracted. We just, if you just feel any of those things, just repent right now. Just tell them, I'm distracted. I'm weak. I'm immature. But I want you. I want you. Your words out loud to him, they will change everything about your life. Everything. It's a risk. It's a risk. Faith is a risk. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, we just release fire right now in Jesus' name. You release glory. I pray that you touch us with all sickness, Lord. That you be our waking, our waking, yearning. That we can hardly go to sleep because we're thinking about you. I just pray, Lord. We can't do it on our own. We can we cannot fabricate that. But you can do it. Nobody's born. I just hear the Lord saying, nobody's born this way. You only get this by asking for it. God, we're asking for it. I just want everybody to minister to somebody. We're the church. We're prophetic people. So ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, who can I pray for today? If you need prayer, I want you to just touch somebody. I want you to say, I need prayer. We're going to break down the culture of one or two people having to pray for everybody. We all have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, come up front here and pray for you. If you got the Holy Spirit, then you got God on the inside. There's no lack. Find somebody that I pray for. Ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what do you see? What do you 
he saying over this person? We need to be a watching people. Watching is prophetic. He's on the other side of the veil. Holy Spirit, we just touch a second body ministry in Jesus' name. serious. If you need the Holy Spirit, come up front. If you don't have the Holy Spirit inside you. haven't baptized by the Holy Spirit, come up front. Or Bye.